Cleveland firefighter William Walker was fatally shot in the driveway of his Euclid Green home on November the 3rd of 2013. His wife, 42-year-old Yoloma Curry, dialed 911 and reported that someone had shot her husband. According to local police, when responders arrived at the scene, the 45-year-old man who was bleeding profusely was being tended to hysterically by his wife. It later emerged that he'd asked Curry, his longtime girlfriend, to marry him after she'd been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. He'd planned for her to receive his health insurance benefits so that she could pay for treatments she couldn't afford. A year after the shooting, an individual came forward with information about the situation after authorities had offered a cash reward. Chad Paget, the boyfriend of Curry's daughter, was identified as a co-conspirator in the firefighter's murder. It was discovered that there was communication between Paget, his girlfriend, Jacqueline Hines, and a third person, 24-year-old Ryan Doughty. Police learned that immediately after Walker was shot, Paget sent out a message that read, We have a body. Law enforcement interrogated Paget and took his DNA sample, which was a match for the DNA recovered from the scene of the crime. In August of 2015, the 20-year-old was arrested for his complicity in the murder. While he was in custody, he told police about the murder plot. Officials found out that Curry had approached her daughter and Paget to look for someone to kill her husband. Paget was introduced to Doughty who ultimately agreed to kill Walker. Paget then supplied him with the murder weapon. Curry informed her co-conspirators that $100,000 was waiting to be collected from her husband's life insurance policy once he was dead. Unbeknownst to her, Walker had been married before and hadn't changed the name of the beneficiary on his insurance from his ex-wife's. Therefore, Curry didn't receive a penny. On July the 7th of 2017, she was found guilty of aggravated murder, conspiracy, felonious assault, as well as other charges. She was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. The other suspects each pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against the mastermind. Number 8. Andrew Clive Baldry on January the 3rd of 2020, Andrew Clive Baldry was sentenced at Swansea Crown Court in Wales to 12 months in prison after he drained more than $31,000 from his widowed girlfriend's life savings. According to court records, the 30-year-old from Milford Haven, Pembrokeshire, sparked up a romance with the woman in 2016 after her husband died of cancer. The widow, who couldn't be named for legal reasons, received a considerable sum of money from her late husband's life insurance policy after he began dating her, Baldry who'd been unemployed, started to help himself to the cash without her knowledge. When he bought himself a new car and spent a lot of money despite being jobless, the victim became suspicious. When she questioned him on the matter, he told her that he'd won $1,300 on a lottery scratch card. Later on, when the woman tried to buy some food, she found out there was only $30 in her account. According to the prosecution, 44 separate small transfers were conducted during the course of their two-year relationship. Bank records indicated that almost $32,000 had been transferred to the suspect's account. After he pleaded guilty to false representation, the prosecutors said that they'd take action to recoup some of the cash. On April the 22nd of 2020, a Proceeds of Crime Act hearing heard that Baldry benefited from his criminality to the tune of over $28,000. However, he only had $26 in available assets. After he'd spent all the money, he was given three months to pay the sum of $26 to the victim after the judge granted a confiscation order. He was released after serving only three months due to the pandemic. Number seven, Cherry Thompson. New York woman Cherry Thompson from Manhattan was given a prison sentence of seven years on December the 21st of 2010 after fleecing two disabled men out of $110,000. A month before her sentence was handed down, the 27-year-old pleaded guilty to grand larceny and scheming to defraud among other charges. The first victim was 63-year-old Howard Zimer, whom she married in 2008. The man later suffered brain damage because of a car accident. Thompson plundered his bank accounts to the sum of $50,000 while she oversaw his transfer to sheltered housing. She later moved on to an 89-year-old dementia patient named John Grant. She attempted to get power of attorney over his bank accounts and cashed in $60,000 from his savings. When she was exposed as a fraudster, she skipped her $15,000 bail as a result of her failure to attend a previous hearing. After receiving the maximum possible sentence, Thompson issued an apology to Zyma and Grant, saying she was sorry that she was such an inconvenience to them. Protection orders were issued on behalf of both victims. Number six, Jocelyn Zakor. 
41-year-old Australian Jocelyn Zakhor seduced two men and pilfered almost $590,000 from them between June and November of 2018. She reportedly used the money as fuel for her gambling addiction. Zakhor worked to gain their trust after meeting them through the dating app Tinder. She told them she needed money for a blueberry and tobacco business and later tried to coax even more money by threatening to contact their spouses about their affairs. Zakhor collected approximately $554,000 from the first victim and $46,000 from the second. One of the men finally contacted the authorities after Zakhor sent him 240 emails that threatened his family. In 2019, she was sentenced to four years and eight months behind bars. She filed to have her sentence reduced with the argument that the victims were stupid for believing her stories. The appeal was rejected on April the 12th of 2022. Number five, Celeste Beard Johnson. At around 3.30 a.m. on October the 3rd of 1999, 75-year-old Stephen Beard was shot with a 20-gauge shotgun while he was asleep at his home in Austin, Texas. He immediately called 911 and said that he needed an ambulance because his guts were coming out of his stomach. 16 weeks later, the elderly man died from complications related to his gunshot wounds. Local authorities suspected Tracy Tarleton, who was a friend of Beard's wife, 36-year-old Celeste Beard Johnson. The latter met Beard after she was admitted to St. David's Pavilion, a mental health facility. Six days after the shooting, Tarleton was arrested. Investigators found a spent shell in Beard's bedroom that matched the personalized shotgun used by the suspect. Initially, Tarleton denied it, but later admitted shooting Beard and agreed to a deal with prosecutors. In July of 2000, Tarleton found out that Johnson had remarried six months after the death of her husband. Before her trial began in March 2002, she broke her silence about the shooting and told police that Johnson had persuaded her to gun down Beard after she'd claimed to be abused by him. Johnson denied Tarleton's allegations but was arrested on March the 28th of 2002 during the resulting trial. Prosecutors contended that Johnson wanted to inherit Beard's fortune and to that end had manipulated her friend into carrying out the shooting. Following Beard's death, the woman was spending between $15,000 and $30,000 during daily shopping sprees. According to Beard's accountant, Johnson spent a total of $670,000 in the aftermath of his death. They called Johnson's twin daughters to the stand and they testified that their mother had sought a hitman to take out Tarleton before her arrest. Under the Texas law of parties, Johnson was convicted of capital murder with a mandatory life sentence in 2003. A 10-year reduced sentence was given to Tarleton after she testified against Johnson. The former was released on parole in August of 2011. Number 4. Kozuke Nozaki On May the 19th of 2021, the 25-year-old widow of a self-made Japanese billionaire and best-selling author was indicted by prosecutors for his murder. Three years prior, on May the 24th of 2018, 77-year-old Kosuke Nozaki, who dubbed himself the Don Juan of Kishu, ingested an illegal stimulant drug. According to the resulting indictment, Nozaki was deliberately killed by his wife, 25-year-old Saki Sudo, just three months into their marriage. After the young woman's phone was analyzed, it was found out that prior to the drugging, she'd searched the internet about stimulants and how murders were made to look like death from an illness. Her phone's location data showed that she'd been in the same place as the suspect who was accused of providing the drug. In the hours before and after his death, camera footage of Nozaki's house showed that the couple were alone at the time. Prosecutors thus concluded that the businessman was poisoned by pseudo. On April the 28th of 2021, the latter was arrested on suspicion of murder as well as a violation of the stimulant drug control law. According to the Tanabe city government, she was entitled to a portion of Nozaki's assets worth almost $12 million following his death. On the day of her indictment, she was served another arrest warrant after she'd swindled a different man out of over $107,000 in January of 2016. Number 3. Emma Rain On October the 21st of 2016, thrice-widowed Emma Rain from Louisiana was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. According to Orleans Parish authorities, 52-year-old Rain was the suspect in the deaths of all three of her past husbands. The woman, who formerly took the surnames Smith and Evans, had been convicted on August the 12th for the murder of her second husband, Ernest Smith. The latter was gunned down on April the 15th of 2006. Three years later, 
Emma received almost $835,000 from Smith's life insurance payout. She eventually married James Rain, who was found in his home with multiple gunshot wounds on October the 21st of 2011. In 2013, 32-year-old Alfred Everett, James's adoptive brother, was identified as Smith's shooter. During the proceedings in August of 2016, he told the court that he'd been promised $10,000 for committing the shooting. He was likewise convicted of murder in the second degree and sentenced to life imprisonment. Additionally, it was alleged that prior to their marriage, James had conspired with Emma to eliminate Smith. Orleans Parish prosecutors suggested that a life insurance payout was the motive and ultimately prevailed over the defense. 70 days later, Emma was sentenced on the fifth anniversary of James's death. One of the victim's family members wanted the day to stick in her mind. Number two, Ruxana Bibi and Mohammed Arif. On the evening of September the 18th of 2016, Mohammed Youssef was murdered while he slept at a rented home in Accrington, Lancashire, England. Yusuf, a 65-year-old man with learning difficulties, reportedly had his throat slit and suffered roughly a dozen blows to his head as a result of a murder plot devised by his wife, Ruxana Bibi, and her secret lover. At the time of the murder, 38-year-old Bibi was out of the country, but camera footage in the area showed that her paramour, 45-year-old Mohammed Arif, was in the area of the rental property at least three times that night. DNA evidence discovered at the scene and money transfers carried out between Bibi and Arif led authorities to conclude that they were stripping the victim's assets before they killed him. According to court records, the secret lovers took out a fraudulent life insurance policy on use of worth over $296,000. Local police said that the woman withdrew over $29,000 from her husband's savings account in a span of four months leading up to his killing. The victim's undated will named his wife as the beneficiary and Arif as a legal guardian. The detective chief inspector said that the manner in which the senior citizen was manipulated was ruthlessly planned. Bibi and Arif were convicted of murder and consequently jailed for life. The woman from Todd Morden was given a minimum of 28 years while her co-defendant from Accrington was ordered to serve at least 32 years before his eligibility for parole could be considered. Longing for more? We have part one lined up for you right after this last listing. Stay tuned if you'd like to watch more. Number one, Raylin Simonin. Arizona man Jack Vincent Persley was found dead by the police in Salisaw, Oklahoma on July the 27th of 2011. Law enforcement discovered the 37-year-old seated in a recliner with multiple gunshot wounds after they were alerted to his whereabouts by the Pinal County Sheriff's Department in Arizona. Persley's wife, 23-year-old Raylin Simonin, had reportedly been the one who informed county officials about him. Her testimony indicated that on July the 25th of 2011, a man who identified himself as a U.S. Marshal went to their home to arrest Persley. Two other men who were armed showed up afterwards and killed her husband. She claimed that after the shooting, the group of men kidnapped and assaulted her. On August the 1st of that same year, Sheriff Ron Lockhart said that three Sequoia County men had been arrested in connection with Persley's murder. The suspects were identified as 51-year-old William Douglas Daniel, David Joseph Daniel Chuck, aged 52, and Craig Neil Hart, aged 54. Daniel told deputies that after Persley had been shot, Simonin spent the night in a bedroom with Daniel Chuck. He added that they'd only planned to scare the victim so that his wife would leave him. Daniel Chuck subsequently admitted that he had an intimate relationship with the woman. According to Sheriff Lockhart, the couple were new to the community, having moved in just five weeks before the incident. The sheriff added that Persley's wife knew that she was the beneficiary of her husband's million-dollar insurance policy. Simonin said that because of the potential million-dollar payout, she agreed to marry him. She reportedly suspected that her husband wasn't wealthy because he was relentlessly pursued by collectors prior to his death. The next morning, after the three suspects were in custody, the woman was also arrested and charged with accessory after the fact. She was held in custody in Arizona and was later extradited to Oklahoma. She was found guilty of being an accessory to first-degree murder and on September the 30th of 2014, was sentenced to 10 years in prison plus 35 years suspended. Number 5. Gana Suzina. In 2008, wealthy British businessman Barry Pring was killed in a hit-and-run incident as he attempted to flag down a taxi in Ukraine. He had just finished dinner with his wife, former Ukrainian lap dancer Gana Suzina. 
She has been accused of being a black widow by Pring's family. This is a colloquial term used for a woman who arranges the killing of her husband in order to seize his fortune. At the time of his death, Pring was worth an estimated one and a half million pounds, which is around two million dollars. The case was initially viewed as an accident, but after pressure from Pring's family, it was reinvestigated as a murder. Suspicions were raised when details into the nature of the accident were revealed. The car that had hit Pring was traveling at 80 miles per hour, had no headlights, and was carrying stolen license plates. Once the car hit Pring, it did not apply its brakes. The vehicle continued traveling, pinning Pring against the barrier for a further 100 meters. It was the best friend of Tsutsina, who came forward as a witness for the case. She claims that Tsutsina was never in love with Pring, instead marrying him purely for his wealth. Barry Pring's brother, Sean, received a Skype call from Tsutsina to tell him his brother was dead. He claimed that Tsutsina appeared cold and detached over the phone, as if she wasn't actually bothered by his death. The Ukrainian police apparently had no suspects in the case, which Pring's family claimed to be outrageous. It was reported that at the time of Pring's death, Tsutsina had had a close friend in a high-ranking position in the police force. This sparked debates regarding issues with corruption in the country. Pring's family wanted intervention and investigation by the British police, but they had no jurisdiction in Ukraine and therefore couldn't charge anyone in the case. They could only assist Ukrainian police if given permission. Number 4. Sandrine Develard Sandrine Develard, a glamorous French woman, was heavily criticized after she contested the will of her recently deceased husband. Sandrine, at the time, 42 years old, had been married to Marcel Ampho, aged 67. A humble farmer, Marcel had amassed riches through properties he owned in his village. He was known by the village to be a bit of a hermit, but was otherwise regarded as a friendly man with a great work ethic. He reportedly had no electricity or running water in his home, and his friends knew him as someone who was content with the basics in life. His attitude was the polar opposite to Sandrine's. That's why, when she and Marcel married in late 2011, locals began having suspicions that Sandrine was only with him for his wealth. It didn't help that Sandrine chose to continue living in her home in Paris, only visiting Marcel from time to time. In 2012, Sandrine got two of her friends to take Marcel out on a drive. Mysteriously, the day trip ended in a crash in which he died while Sandrine's two friends survived. After Marcel's death, Sandrine unsuccessfully attempted to evict the tenants of the houses owned by him. Sandrine contested that they now belong to her. However, to her shock, it was revealed that Marcel's will, written on the back of an envelope, split his assets between his tenants and his cousin. Nothing was to be given to Sandrine. She was dumbfounded to discover she had been excluded from the will, even going so far as to hire a lawyer in an attempt to disprove that the handwriting on the will was Marcel's. Experts, however, concluded that it was his authentic writing. Number 3. Pamela Phillips In 1996, Gary Triano, a wealthy real estate developer, was killed by a pipe bomb as he got into his car after playing golf in Tucson, Arizona. Pamela Phillips, a socialite, was previously married to Triano, having separated from him after he'd lost a large percentage of his fortune to gambling. Although the two were separated, Phillips was still listed as the beneficiary of Triano's $2 million life insurance policy. Triano was also the father of Phillips' two children. After suffering financial difficulties herself, it was revealed that Phillips, with the help of her ex-boyfriend, Ronald Young, had plotted to kill Triano to cash in on the life insurance policy. Phillips agreed to pay Young $400,000 for the killing. Within weeks of Triano's death, the attention was on her as the main suspect. A van rented by Young was found abandoned shortly before the bombing, with documents related to Phillips and Triano's divorce. A sawed-off shotgun and a map of the area were also found inside. Young was arrested in 2008 after going on the run for a previous fraud investigation. Pamela Phillips had already fled to Austria, where she too 
was eventually arrested in 2009. She was discovered and extradited to Arizona more than 10 years after Triano's murder. In 2010, Young was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Pamela Phillips was later convicted on the same charges. They were both sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 2. Des Campbell The only male gold digger on this list, Des Campbell murdered his wife, Janet Fisicaro, by pushing her off of a cliff in New South Wales, Australia. The former police officer's motive was a piece of Fisicaro's estate worth an estimated $100,000. Des had planned a camping trip with Janet and had pitched their tent on a cliff in the Royal National Park. It was an odd choice because the area where Des had chosen to set up was riddled with rocks, in huge contrast to the much more comfortable and established Burning Palms campsite nearby. The jury was informed that this area was also far enough from the main walking trails so nobody would see or hear Janet's murder. Prosecutors allege that Des somehow lured Janet to the edge of the cliff, where he then pushed her. He then attempted to make the killing look like an accident by using a rope to climb down to his dead wife before calling the emergency services. Des's actions in the days and weeks following her seemingly accidental death were quite suspicious. Five days after she'd fallen from the cliff to her death, Des was meeting his solicitor to discuss Janet's will. Two days after that, he was holidaying in North Queensland with one of his many secret girlfriends. Des didn't turn up at Janet's funeral, which further raised suspicions. A long investigation followed. It called forward 45 witnesses, including a few of Des's previous partners. In 2009, four years after Janet's death, he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 33 years in prison. Number 1. Shera Wright Shera Wright was married to Lorenzen Wright, an American professional basketball player. Lorenzen's family had suspicions that Shera was a gold digger, but they never could have foreseen how the relationship would play out. Lorenzen had earned over $55 million during his 13 seasons in the league, but by the time his contract ended, both he and Shera were having financial difficulties. In February of 2010, after 13 years of marriage, in which they had seven children together, the two decided to divorce. Shera continued living in Memphis while Lorenzen moved to Atlanta. On Sunday, July the 18th of 2010, Lorenzen was visiting Memphis to see his children. The trip also provided him with the opportunity to watch one of his children, Lorenzen Jr., play basketball. Later that evening, Lorenzen visited Shera, but then he mysteriously disappeared. Just after midnight on July the 19th, Lorenzen used his cell phone to call 911. He spoke to a dispatcher in Tennessee but was unable to provide any information about his location. Georgetown 911, where's your emergency? Hello? 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 I have nothing but gunshots. Hello? He was found over a week later in a marsh. Exposed to the elements, his 6 foot 11 body had decomposed from 260 pounds to just 57. Examining the scene, investigators ruled that he'd been shot by two guns. One year after Lorenzen's death, a $1 million life insurance policy was paid to Shera Wright. The delay in the payout was caused by the murder investigation, which had brought no clues up to that point. Shera spent the entirety of the policy in just a few months a lot of it on luxury items. Several years went by with little progress made in the investigation until the fall of 2017. In November, a gun was recovered from a lake in Walnut, Mississippi. Ballistic investigation was able to link the gun to the bullets that were used to kill Lorenzen. Three weeks later, police arrested Billy Ray Turner for the murder of Wright. Shera was also arrested on murder charges. It was revealed that Shera and Billy had known each other for a while and had conspired twice to kill Lorenzen, with the second time being successful. Another man was also linked to the killing. Shera Wright eventually pleaded guilty to facilitation of murder in the first degree. She was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Wright must serve at least 30% of her sentence 
which means she could be eligible for release in 2026. Lorenzen's family continues to fight at parole hearings to keep her in jail for as long as possible. Thanks for watching. Would you rather get stung by an Australian box jellyfish or marry a gold digger? Let us know in the comments section below.